Hello and welcome to the world of NDE 4.0. My name is Johannes Frana and today is a great day. Because today we will finally get to the video on the scanning grid. Now we started our journey somewhere with some history on ultrasonics, we got into some basics, talked about phased array ultrasonics, and we talked about automated scanning. We also talked about the sound field. Now we are coming to a topic which is my eyes really critical one because it's critical for the quality of our ultrasonic inspection. The topic of the scanning grid. Now, if we do a manual inspection, and if we have the opportunity that we can use actually a very high pulse repetition frequency, then we move our probe during our manual inspection. And we see somewhere a peak coming up, just a tiny bit. And you will go back to that peak and you will try to maximize it. And then you will see, oh, that peak is actually a little bit, a lot larger than I originally expected. Now, if you do an automated scanning, you have your machine doing the scanning for you. So if that machine only records a tiny thing coming up and that perhaps just at one shot yeah then you will have your gate and your signal will be underneath the gate so actually that signal will not be detected at all and as it is an automated inspection you will not go back to that lit situation and actually try to maximize it so what we need to do we need to have a scanning grid which is dense enough so that if you have a signal coming up that you automatically get already the correct amplitude of your signal so you see for me scanning grid it is important for manual inspection already because you kind of need to know okay how far or how fast can I move my pro, uh, my probe, and how yeah, in which in the intervals should I put that probe onto my component? But for manual or or for but for automated testing, it is really one of the key informations. Let's get started. Now, last time we talked about. One of the past videos, we talked about automated ultrasonic inspection. And we saw that we have a certain grid in the next direction. And then we are moving the probe kind of continuously in our scan direction. But due to a certain pulse repetition frequency, we also get in our scan direction a certain grid. So let's keep Let's stay on that one line in our on our index axis and let's move on our scan axis and let's have our pulsar pulsing. We can see, yeah, we are getting shots at certain intervals and therefore we have a grid which kind of looks like this. And with every point in our scanning grid, we are recording one A scan. And now, we are getting to our sound field information. At every point, we are emitting this sound field into our component. And depending on whether we are close to the surface or further away, we get the different size of our beam diameter. And that beam diameter can be smaller than our active element and our probe, and it can be bigger than our active element. So we have to see, okay, what is our inspection requirements? Where do we have to start? What is the shortest sound path we have to take into account? A minimal sound path. Let's say we have a probe and we only, we can inspect from two sides and we only do the back half. Yeah, then we only take into account long, a long sound path. So our minimal sound path we have to take into account is the middle of our component. 
because then we're doing the same inspection from the other side. So we will end up with a quite relaxed scanning group. But if we only can do an inspection from one side, yeah, then in that case, we will have a quite dense requirement for our scanning group. Now, there is also a possibility to actually calculate such an inspection grid, such a scanning grid. Now, what we need to know for that is this is kind of the scanning grid at a certain sound path, at a certain distance from your surface. And we can already see that this scanning grid is actually not sufficient because what we can see here in the middle here, we have kind of a gap. Now, what you see here, those we call them dumplings. Those dumplings are actually our 60B size of our sound beam. So already within, if we have an indication, and we find it here, and here being the center of our probe, that indication will already be undersized by about minus 60 B, but that's a different note. And everything within this gap is actually undersized by more than 60 B. And that's something we have to be aware of. Now you already see here some numbers. Number one, it is the diameter of our sound bundle, both in scan direction and in index direction. Number two, we see down here, this is here the distance between our two index lanes, between two scan lines. And this is here the distance from one shot to the next. So this really depends on our pulse repetition frequency. Now we can take those four numbers and calculate out of this what we call the normalized grid rating. Rn. Now, if we see that our Rn gives a factor of 1.0, then we know that we have a gapless inspection. We know that we have a maximum undersizing of 60 Bs in this case. If we go to an Rn of 2, then we know that every single point within our scanning grid is touched by at least two of our shots. If we get to an Rn of four, it means, yeah, at least four times, Rn of eight, at least eight times. But this, and this is how it continues. An Rn of lower than one means that we will have gaps. An Rn of 0.5 means, yeah, that we have actually our beams touching. And what you can already kind of see if you have something like this 10% overlap of a sound field, that also might not be sufficient because then we still would end up with some gap here in between. So really this normalized grid rating is the way to go to really tell you, okay, do I have a sufficient scanning grid? Now, up to the moment, we talked about flat components. You can see here, those are rotor forgings for the power generation industry. And you can see they are round. And on those components, we have pretty yeah, extensive scanning requirements. Actually, the inspection of one of them takes about eight hours. About 10 different scan directions. Here you can see another one. This is a big shaft for a generator. And you can see they are already using here, in this case, four different probes at the same time. And some of them are actually phased array probes. So, and the requirements we have to fulfill here is, yeah, we have an axial inspection. We have radial inspection. We have inspections using, you can see them here, those radial tangential. Those are using phased array probes with a certain angle steering. We have shear wave probes with 45 degrees. 
We have axial radial inspections here, also with 45. We have radial axial inspection with 45. So we have all those different inspections. Now, the formulas for getting, for calculating actually how big is our beam diameter at a certain sound path, it's getting a little bit more complicated <laughs> than just, or yeah, it's getting wider. It's actually coming to situations like this. This is, yeah, kind of like a probe putting it on the component. And we have here a certain angle we are firing here into our component. And this, what we can see here, this D dash is actually the size of our sound bundle. We have to put into our calculations. Now, you there are formulas how to calculate it, but that is nothing I would want to do with a calculator. Even Excel will be kind of tricky. And there is a document called DGZFP US 07. This is the guideline for the determination of the scanning grid for automated ultrasonic testing. Now it was written mostly for the purpose of large rotor forging, but you can actually use it for any component you want to inspect. And it will give you all of those formulas for all of those different situations. Now, as already this example shows, they might be getting a little bit tricky to calculate. And that's why I created a program, a little program, ah, by the way, it's not that little anymore. I created a program to help you do the calculations on how dense your scanning grid has to be for all kinds of different inspection situations. Let me show you that program. So here you can see the software I created, which contains all of the formulas for all of the different situations. What you see here, down here, this is actually the display of those dumplings I showed before. So you get, you get a visual interpretation of what we are seeing. Up here, this graph, it actually shows this green line you're seeing here. This is the RN, independency of your sound path. So here at a short sound path, we have an RN of 1.19 at this case. And going up to a sound path of 800, we actually have an RN of, yeah, that's pretty high. That's kind of about 100. And I can actually move to different locations. I can move to a very early sound path, like about 50 millimeters. And here you can see, yeah, all those white dumplings and red space in between. So you immediately see this scanning grid will not be sufficient. We then go to about 100 millimeters. We see, okay, here, that's a fine. And if we go to, let's say, 350, we see, ah, yeah, now we are good to go. Now we have, and this is what you can see here, we have about a 35 times overlap between at every single point of our inspection. So this is number one, the part number one of this program, which helps with the visualization of your inspection situation, of your scanning grid. And for sure, this is mainly for automated inspection because here you can control your inspection very accurately, but it's also for manual inspection for you to visualize how, how slow you have to go. Now, what do you do if you have a certain inspection situation and you want to calculate your scanning grid? Then you select up here your probe. I have put a couple of probes in here and depending on your needs, I can also put different ones in here. So let's take one a lot of people use around here in Europe one from Waygate, a B2S. And it automatically populates all the values needed for the B2S, like the opening angle of 3.7 degrees, both in scan direction and in index direction. Now, this comes from the point because this is round transducer. If we think more about a phased array probe, and yes, this tool can also be used for phased array probes, then our opening angle is, will be different and scan and an index direction, depending on your aperture of your phased array. Now, after selecting your probe, 
you can get here into whether you want to have an X or whether you are conducting an axial or radial inspection. So this is also built for round components, but for sure you can also do it for flat components. If you want to do for flat, you just pick axial. Then you have to select, is this a normal probe or a dual element probe? In this case, it is a B2S, so this is a normal probe, no Turin Smith receive. You put in an OD and an ID, um, actually not, not necessary really for axial inspection. And then what we can do, okay, here we can have to calculate scanning grid. And we can tell it, okay, the shortest sound path we want to account for is 50 millimeters. And the longest, let's say, is 500. We put them in here and we click on calculate scanning grid. And then it do, does all the calculations for us. We click on OK. And it actually tells us, OK, what we need to do is we need to have a scanning grid in index direction. You see here dx in millimeters of 4.57. So four point, in intervals of 4.57 millimeters, we have to do one shot. Now, we talked about, OK, this depends on the PRF. So if we have, in case we have a PRF of 20, then this comes true if we have a scan speed of 91.4. I know that's a lot of information, but what if you want to use this tool, we can get in a lot more details on this one. Now, I can also do the way the opposite way. We can say, okay, we have a certain PRF we are putting our instrument to. We want to use a certain scanning speed, let's say 100. Then actually that program calculates backwards what our DX needs to be. Now we can immediately see that if we do that, those red things are popping up. So we immediately know that this will not be sufficient. So either we reduce our scanning speed or we could also reduce our pulse repetition frequency to let's say 18. Ah, I have to put in here once more 100, 18 and 100. Yeah, you see, I did it the wrong way. And that's a good thing about visualization. You can immediately see what's going on. So let's get to 25 and again 100. And now we are good to go. And the same here now for the index direction. In the index direction, the program is telling us, okay, we need a dy of 4.57 millimeters. So our in index direction, we need to have an inspection in 4.57 millimeter intervals. Now, most cases you will not use exactly 4.57. You will do either 4.5 or 4 or 5, not something with two digits after the comma. But let's say, yeah, we reduced here a little bit the scanning grid by increasing a little bit our PRF. So let's try to reduce it a little or make it a little bit wider here in the index direction. Let's see if that's still okay. So let's put in five. And we can see, yeah, it's still fine. Okay, and now I can try and just go to different locations. Okay, I'm here at 50. I can go to, let's say, 350. And this is kind of our how our scanning grid will look like. Now, if we go to a radial inspection and perhaps do an inspection from the OD, we have an outer diameter of 1,000, an inner diameter of 300. We go to, let's say, a WB45, so a 45-degree transverse probe. And again, we want to inspect all the way from, let's say, starting from 100, going to 500, and we can do calculate scanning grid. And this is what it comes up. So now with a PRF of 25, we need a scan speed of 331. So that might be a little bit overshooting because this is really moving fast. And then here on the index direction, we have 4.69. So pretty narrow indexing actually between them. So let's say we only can do 150 millimeters with our system. So let's get here to 150 millimeters. You can see we now have a very dense scanning grid. So therefore we can now 
have a less than scanning rate on the index. So it's always, if you increase one, you have to reduce the other. And I can either do that by typing in here some numbers, I'm trying it, or I can say here, okay, this is really what I want to use. I want to use in the scan direction, a PRF of 25 Hertz and a speed of 150. So I say, okay, I lock my DX, so it doesn't change anymore. And I hit here on scan calcul uh, scanning grid. And it ends up telling us, okay, for the index report, you can see here, it didn't change anything here, but it changed the scanning grid in the Y direction, in the index direction. And it telling us, okay, best is to use a DY of 6.28. So let's go to six, and it will be most likely the scanning grid I would be using. And then I can go again to a different sound path and I can either use the slider or I can also put it in here. Let's say I go to a sound path of 200. That's the situation at 200. Or if I go to 50, yeah, at 50, no surprise, we do not have a sufficient scanning grid. So you can see this tool now, if you would have to use the formulas, it would be way more complicated. This tools helps to make it a little bit more easy, but it's still a program where you need to know what you have to do. And therefore, if you would like to get into this topic, I do not just offer this program for download. I offer this program together with trainings because they, I think that's what you really need so that you can finally use it for your automated inspection or for your manual inspection. So just send me an email or contact me in all the other media if you're interested in that project and we can get together for seeing what your need is for this program. Because I also need to know a kind of your inspection situation so that I can really tailor the training and the program for your need. So thank you for watching. I hope it wasn't too many uh, equations for you. If you have any comments, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. If you want to use this tool for the automated or for determining the scanning grid, feel free to send me an email and we will get into a quote, depending on your need for that tool. Next time, we will be talking about calibration method, which is really popular over here in Europe. And that's called AVG, Amplitude Verstärkung Größe, or DGS in English, Distance Gain Size. And I think it's a really good method for calibration and size determination of flaws. And I think it's worthwhile to learn a little bit about this method. As usual, you will find more information in the description. I hope you like this video. I hope you subscribe to this channel. I hope I will see you soon. So thank you for watching. See you soon. Thank you and bye.